Tonight on Mob Talk, inside the local underworld with the informants who helped take down the Philly mob. Fox 29's Dave Schratweiser and the Inquirer's George Anastasia on the life and times of mob captain turned informant, Ron Previty. We're here at 3rd in Oregon in South Philadelphia for this week's edition of Mob Talk. I'm Dave Schratweiser. And I'm George Anastasia with the Philadelphia Inquirer. George, this week we're going to talk about informants, rats, cooperators, call them what you will. If the feds want to bring a new indictment here in South Philadelphia, they're going to need an informant and insider. So we're going to talk about the best and worst of informants over mob history in Philadelphia. Yeah, every major case that we've seen has had a key informant, a key witness who could put the jury out there on the streets. And I think one of the all-time best was Big Ron Previty, the guy I wrote a book about, former cop, and he had a devastating effect on the Italian Marino organization. All right, George, so let's talk about Ron Previty, uh, right-hand man in the John Stanfa era, and then somehow transitions to the Joey Merlino mob, but this time around wearing one of these, a wire. Absolutely. I mean, he was part of Stanford's palace guard, and when Stanford and those guys got indicted, and in 1995, he stayed out on the streets. And if you talk to Previty, he'll tell you, I wouldn't have trusted me, but Joey and Ralph trusted him. And the reason they trusted him is he brought an envelope every time he saw him. He brought an envelope with cash. And that was his entree into the other faction of the organization. A moneymaker. A moneymaker and earner always was, uh, to this day, still a moneymaker. And that's, I think, above and beyond everything else in the underworld. If you can bring money to the table, you have value. And that's what he played off of. Joey and the guys thought they were taking advantage of Ron Previty, but really, wearing a wire, he was taking advantage of them. Absolutely. I mean, this is a guy who strapped on a wire in February of 1997 and taped through June of 1999. Hundreds of conversations. And that's the difference, I think, between Ron Previty and some of the other informants. A lot of the other informants who were good, John Vesey, Nick Caramondi, they started cooperating after they got jammed up after they were uh, under indictment or about to be indicted. Ron Previty was proactive. He's out there on the streets before he's charged with anything. He's put on a wire and he's working for the FBI. And, and I think that made him more effective in terms of what he did. Also, the risk was much higher. And I think Previty's personality got off on that. He enjoyed living on the edge. He always has, and I think he always will. Money maker for himself, too. Uh, rather lucrative profession for Ron, Pre Ron Previty. Working for the feds has made over a million dollars, if I think the estimates yeah, are. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the reports when he testified, the amount of money he was paid. When he had his contract with the FBI when he was wearing the wire, I think it was in excess of $9,000 a month was his contract. Uh, separate and apart from that, when he was on the streets, he was a big money maker. When he was running his operation down in Hamilton, bookmaking, loan sharking, he had massage policy. He, he, he was... He used to call himself a general practitioner of crime. He wasn't a specialist. He made money in a lot of different ways. So he knew the ins and outs of the organization. And one of the reasons he started cooperating was he's a mercenary, and he realized it was over. He said, you know, you look at these guys, and you knew that the whole idea of honor and loyalty was by the boards. It was all about greed. It was every man for himself. And at, at the end of the day, Ron Previty's loyalty was to the guy he was looking at in the mirror in the morning. That's where his loyalty went. Let's talk about some of the tapes he made. He made one here at the Oregon Diner at 3rd and Oregon. Pretty classic, right. he and John Changlini. Right, that's a classic tape, and, and it, that particular tape, I think, is what buried John Changlini. They're sitting in the Oregon Diner talking about problems, talking about the way to conduct yourself, and, and they were trying to patch up a discrepancy that existed in terms of a shakedown. And, and they both discuss the ways of organized crime. And that kind of set the tone for who John Changlini was, and when the jury heard that, and reinforced with a lot of other evidence, it kind of buried him in that case. Okay, is he the prototypical guy that the feds want if they're going to have a new indictment? They want a guy like that? They want a guy who's, one, on the inside, and two, has access at the highest levels. And Previty had access to Ralph Natale, and he had access to Joey Molino. And that's what you want. I mean, those are the guys, those are the targets. Everything else falls in place if you get the head of the organization. And that's what Ron Previty delivered. He delivered those guys. Joey and his guys always thought they had a leg up on Ron Previty. But at the end of the day, the guy who comes out on top is Ron Previty. Yeah, I mean, it's a game. Who's playing who? And I remember talking to the wife of Johnny Chang and the, and the ex-wife of George Borghese after this all went down. And the wives have a much more realistic view of what happened. I mean, the wise guys say, oh, Previty's a rat, Previty's this, Previty's that. The wife said, you know what? Previty won and our husband's lost. He's out on the streets living his life, and they're in jail. And that's the bottom line, and that's the way Ron Preverty looked at everything. He was a realist, a realist from the get-go. And, you know, he doesn't object to being called a rat. 
He was what he was. He did what he did. But basically, if you talk to him, he'll say, let me see somebody else put a wire on and go out every day and put their life on the line. That's what I did. Did they pay me a million dollars, the FBI? Maybe. But what's it worth to you to put your life on the line? And he said that from the witness stand. Very effective. You wrote a book called The Last Gangster. Right. It's all about Ron Previty. Why do you think he's the last gangster? Because he survived the organized crime as it is in the 21st century. It's no longer about honor and loyalty. It's greed and treachery. And how do you get over and how do you survive? So that's Ron Previty. Next week, we're going to talk about another top informant, John John Beasy, who got up on the witness stand under the most adverse conditions possible. They killed his brother the day he was scheduled to testify, but he still got up. Yeah, I mean, they thought that was going to be a way to intimidate him, and in fact, if anything, it made him more determined. And of all the witnesses I've seen testify in mob trials, I've never seen a witness connect so well with the jury as John John Beasy did. He just had the jury in the palm of his hands when he told the story. And he buried the stand. Absolutely stand. buried them. Very, the, probably the most effective of several informants in that particular case. So that's it for this week's version of Mob Talk. We'll see you next week.